one of the best writers out there for jazz ensemble as well as for concert band is Mike Kamoff. If you don't know that name, you should. He is a great writer out of the Maryland area and also a longtime educator, also a trumpet performer. And I'm really excited to meet with him today on episode number 82 of the Growing Band Director podcast. A little bit about what you can expect from our time together today. Um, first, uh, he's going to be giving a clinic uh, to us that he's done other places and can be found on his website that he does for Alford. His website is mikecamoff.com. And the clinic is called Start Your Engines, Building Confidence with Less Experienced Rhythm Section Players. So he's got a lot of stuff on here that he presents at, at state conferences and things like that. And I'm excited to bring those to you today. Also, we're gonna, um, I'm going give to give you a chance to hear some of my recommendations for some of the Mike Kamoff charts that I've bought in the past and I've used in the past and I think are really good, especially for younger jazz bands. My wife has used them as well, and we like these charts a lot. Um, Mike's also given us a list of charts and concert band pieces that we're going to listen to snippets of as well that he would like you to hear about. Um, and I can tell you they're all great music. Mike is a writer. Uh, for Alfred, as well as for Chos, and has written for University of Northern Colorado Jazz Press uh, and FJH. Hopefully I didn't miss any. Uh, he holds a performance, a jazz performance and music ed degree from Youngstown State University and a master's in instrumental conducting from George Mason University. Mike's compositions and arrangements have been performed by numerous jazz artists. Mike has performed with the Woody Herman Band and Tommy Dorsey Orchestras and has recorded as a member of the Alan Baylock Jazz Orchestra. He served as an assistant principal trumpet for the Youngstown Symphony Orchestra uh, in the 90s. Mike freelances as a commercial trumpet player in the Baltimore and Washington, D.C. areas. And from my research on Mike's background, he's a longtime educator in Maryland. And it looks to me like he has taught every level from collegiate all the way down through spending a long time as a middle school band director, been done, have, having done a lot of honor bands, and as I said, now a clinician for Alfred as well. So um, I hope, really hope you enjoy this episode with Mike. I'm looking forward to bringing it to you. Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to the Growing Band Director podcast. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Our mission is to share practical advice and explore topics that will help every band director, no matter your experience level, as well as music education students who are working to join us in the coming years. Together, we will discuss many aspects of a well-rounded band program, but most importantly, we will discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs each and every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're right, you rot. Let's get started. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for being here with us on the Growing Band Director podcast. How are you doing? Great, Kyle. Thanks for having me. Uh, it is truly an honor to, to, to be on the podcast. I appreciate it. Everything's going great. Can't complain about anything. Great. In the, in the life. <laughs> So I'm lo lo looking forward to uh, listening to a lot of your music today and hearing about this clinic called Start Your Engines, which is uh, you subtitled Building Confidence with Less Experienced Rhythm Section Players. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I, f I find that with young teachers, especially the key to the rhythm section is really the key to the, the whole jazz ensemble. Do you agree? Oh, I totally agree. And, and that's that's one of the, the, the problems when I, when I started teaching middle school back in the mid 90s, I had only taught high school and uh, uh, for one year and a little bit of college level and then elementary where I didn't have a jazz program. And when I, when I took, started working with middle school students, I was like, Oh my Lord, I have to like, I, this is not, this is not good. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not swinging at all. We can't, we're not reading notation. Right. It's like, so um, yeah, it's, it's definitely the, the, the wheel. It's definitely the engine rather uh, to move the wheels of the band. And it, we have you know, we have to really instill confidence and, and, and the young musicians. And I've got some tips for that. So that yeah. sounds like a setup to me. So um, that's a setup. Yeah. Yeah. So um, start your engine building confidence with less experienced rhythm section players is so great. We can foster confidence in young rhythm section players. And then you have five main keys areas of what we're going to go through. So the first yeah. one is called providing the correct gear and encouraging them to purchase the higher quality instruments and accessories. Right. So for 
and and to actually to have it at school too as, as best as we can with with our budgets uh, when we're looking at guitars the uh you know students are going to show up with the you know with the solid body guitars and those are great for you know like rock tunes and and more contemporary things and funk tunes and that but to get that sound um we really need a hollow body guitar mm -hmm. uh, to get that, that right sound for the straight ahead jazz sound and uh you know the the, the bassy sound which seems to be really predominant when we're, when we're focused on teaching swing to young students and also, um, you know, it also works great on, on Latin American music as well. Um, so finding a hollow body that's affordable. Ibanez makes a great, uh, uh, the art core series. Uh, it's very affordable, um, not only for school budgets, but also for students too. It's a great uh, starting point for, uh, for a young guitarist. So just that instrument alone is huge. And then for the amps, just finding an, an amp that works, you know, uh, DV makes a great amp. Roland, the Roland Cube 60 is good. Uh, the Polytone Mini Brutes are great. The Fender Champion, there's, there's different, there, there's different ones. Uh, model numbers are always changing all the time, but those mm -hmm. those series are, are still, uh, relevant for the amps. And, and then and, for, yeah, and, no, sorry, and I, I will just say, and I've said this a couple of times on other podcast episodes, can you, can you talk a little bit about the settings on the amp in general, what you're looking for in the guitar sound? And yeah, you want it to get not it, looking for. Right. You want, you want, you want, uh, you want it to, to cut, but also to be, you know, complimentary to, you know, the times you want it to cut through so that you hear it's there. So I, I, I kind of just keep everything in the middle and then make adjustments from there as, as we're going. Your players also have to have a setting if they're going to solo, they have to make sure that they are um, just just kind of for, for me that they have a, a, a louder setting for soloing and mm -hmm. a, a lower volume for when they're comping and complimenting in the ensemble. And in general, a warm sound. A warm, we're going for a warm sound, not in our bright sound. Right. Yeah. yeah. So a little bit more mids, a little bit more lows. Yeah. And then for a rock tune, they can have a different setting if they're, especially if they're solo or whatever. But sure. even then it's, you know, we, we're still going for that, those mids and lows, not necessarily the highs. Great. Let's talk about piano. What do you recommend? So, you know, the acoustic piano is basically it for everything, but that's not always like, you know, the, the we can't always have that. Right. So it's having right. any kind of, any kind of portable keyboard, a Kurtz file, a, a Roland uh, KC550 is a great one. And uh, th I'm sorry, th that's the amps. The um, uh, I'm looking at the wrong thing here. We might want to cut this out. <laughs> well, 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 I want to say, set me up for the piano again. Sorry. <laughs> so what are we looking for on pianos? So, w of course, we want an acoustic piano because that's that's the main sound. But if we're traveling, you know, or, or we're doing a different kind of style tune, you know, an electric keyboard is going to work great. Um, the Kurtz file SP series are, are pretty sturdy, pretty affordable for most budgets. Um, they work great. And then uh, the Roland KC amp, the, the KC series, the 550 is, is, is pretty portable and pretty powerful. Uh, and, and again, we're looking for not bright sounds. We're looking for, you know, the mids and the lows and not necessarily uh, cutting sounds with, uh, with our amp settings. Yeah, and it's really important um, anytime you have an amplifier, again, to set it at the right level, because how many how many bands have you adjudicated where if you just turn the amps down, their score would go up 10 points? <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> I heard, heard a couple last week, but I was like... <laughs> Yeah, but be, be, you know, accepting that the rhythm section is supposed to accompany the horn players, I think that getting that balance is a really, really important thing. Right, and 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 a credit to those horn sections that I heard they were keeping up with what was going on in the rhythm section too. So that was some, some uh, they were moving some air, but but that's not what we want. We want we we want a cohesive unit sound and uh, and 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 the ability to like kind of set volumes in the mid level and then like. You know, for the piano players, you know, like you know, like in a, in a normal acoustic piano setting where you're going to play a little heavier for the louder passages, and you know, like it's. So we want to. We don't want to compensate with the amp for that. We want to be able to compensate on the instrument for that. So just keeping it, everything at kind of a general setting is is uh, medium level volume setting is good. As, as a quick side note, when we're talking about dynamics in the jazz ensemble, it's isn't it amazing that if you get your drummer to play the right dynamics, it changes it for everything. Right. I mean, yes. if, you, get, if, yes, if you want the band to be really soft, get the drummer to play really soft on the right cymbal or on the hi-hat closed or whatever. And if if the drummer does the dynamics accordingly, the entire band is going to do what they hear. I love showing video clips of Jeff Hamilton to young students because mm -hmm. 
Jeff plays the gamut. And and the first off, the video quality and the sound quality is really good because these are like very, you know, recent recordings. Um, sometimes the kids don't always buy in if it's real grainy or whatever. They're, they're not, they, they tune out or whatever. But it's kind of the production on a lot of the things that Jeff's in is, is, is pretty great. So to show him driving an ensemble softly, you know, <laughs> you know, like in that Mel Lewis tradition that, that he plays in. Uh, and it's so great to 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 be able to to to, to show that to students. So yes, absolutely. That that dynamic of your drum set player is setting the tone for the for the for the band. One of my mentors used to say, uh, Tony Leonardi, who was uh, jazz studies uh, coordinator at Youngstown State University, um, was a great mentor and friend to me. And he always used to say, "I can make a jazz band with a bass player, a drummer, a lead trumpet player, and a lead alto player. Mm -hmm. That's it." That's all. And, and he he did it. And those those four, I would put lead bone in there, too. But but the, those are the key players and getting it all to line up. And if and if those players all have the same sense of, of, of dynamics and a phrasing and a style, we're good to go. Uh, Love it. So that's. Yeah, that's just my two cents, whatever that's worth. <laughs> of course, it's worth it. That's why you're here. Oh, OK. <laughs> that's right. why you're here. I, yeah. Um, all right. Let's go on to bass. What do you recommend? Sure. Well, obviously, upright is is a big, big concern. Uh, if, if you can, if you've got that in your program, if you have that to your availability, use it. Use it to your advantage. Um, electric's going to be great for uh, you know more contemporary tunes, rock tunes, and 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 uh, and some funk tunes or whatever. But for the most part, we're going to if if you can use an upright bass, if you have a student that's interested or students that are interested, use it. Now pickups get into a a, 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 a little bit of a, uh, a an issue. I there's a lot on the market. My mm -hmm. favorite one is the Underwood pickup, which you buy from UnderwoodPickups.com. Uh, it's it's first off, if you can if I can put it on a bass, anybody can put it on a bass. My wife was like cringing when she saw me like doing this. She's like, oh no, no, well you're gonna do that. It's like I filed I filed the bridge down just right. Got the got the the mics in there. Um, it's 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 very. If I can do it, anybody can do it. It's uh, it's very uh, warm sounding. It's a warm sounding pickup, which mm -hmm. is great because it's not. Uh, it's it's uh, some of the pickups that I've used. I'm not going to name names, but they're real bright. Some inconsistent sounds from them sometimes. Um, this one's very consistent sound, and it pairs great with a hard key kickback twelve, which is one of my favorite amps because. Um, it kicks back and the, the sound shoots out up to the player and over the ensemble and not necessarily across, you know what I'm saying? Across and into people's legs and that the sound actually travels out. So that's one of my favorite amps to use with students. And it works great with that underwood pickup and, 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 and other bass too. So great. Uh, on here under drums, you say a smaller kit is preferred for preferred for jazz um, snare drum, bass drum, pedal, one mounted Tom and floor Tom. Yes. And and that's I, I, I feel that way. I think we if we give the kids too much to hit, <laughs> yep. things get a little bit more complicated, right? So um a lot of the a lot of the manufacturers, drum manufacturers, uh, Gretsch makes a great uh, uh small uh we call them cocktail kits, the for j uh, small jazz cocktail kits. And uh theirs is the their, their series is the Catalina, the Ludwig's is called uh break beats, I think. I think uh, Quest Love like designed that like few years back and i think they're still on the market um but the, the gretsch catalina is kind of like a staple for a, a lot of programs uh mm -hmm. and it's it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a very transportable kit it's a very uh easy kit to tune and to and to get the sound good with the ensemble um and it's very durable too and for symbols you recommend uh let's see include hi-hats 14 inch one to two crash symbols 16 to 8 inch, 18 inches, one ride symbol, and others if desired for different colors. Um, and you have a bunch of other things here. For me, I usually like to, I would amend that I I, I, I would prefer to have one crash and two rides um, yeah. in, in, in my programs, what I've used, because I just like to have that al that alternate, but I see where you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, it depends. It's a preference thing, but I think having, especially if you are someone who, like, like, like what I like to do is uh, I'd like to feature as many students as possible mm -hmm. um, to a fault sometimes because we'd be playing for too long. Uh, yeah, I get you. That's, <laughs> that's a whole that's a whole thing, too. But yeah. but I really like to have students uh, as solo and, and get creative with, with improvisation and, and highlight as much as I can. So I think 
having options for your drummer, especially when you are opening things up for soloists so that the audience isn't getting the same information all the time, the same timbre, the same color all the time over and over and over again. Um, at the end, I was using a nice, I uh, had a, a Zildjian swish knocker that really was kind of like uh, very flexible. It could be a, it could be an extra ride. It could be an extra crash. Um, again, going back to Jeff Hamilton, watch how Jeff Hamilton uses the, those, that, that China color symbol in his kit. Uh, that's a great way, a uh, great reference for students too, and as, as to how to manipulate that symbol and, and use an extra color symbol in the kit that can really give the ensemble a much mature sound too. Um, there's also these things called crash rides, uh, which mm-hmm. I, I have a number of them, of them that I use for different purposes. I yeah. found as I get older and older, I like the kids riding on them less and less because some of the ones had, they tend to get too too boomy on the upper frequencies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, if you don't mind, I know you're going to mention a couple symbol brands that you really like. Yeah. Can I throw in one that I've had recommended to me? That's probably about companies 10 years old that I like uh, yeah, sure. and has worked well for us at a pretty cheap price. It's called the dream symbol and oh, nice. you can get, you can get whole packs and things, but they sound like really nice symbols for yeah. I'm uh, writing you know, that down. 200, 200 bucks or something like that. Nice. I'm not going to say they're better than some of these other high priced ones, but they work really well for school. Okay. Now are they hand hammered or? Uh, so I don't know. They look like okay. they are, but I, yeah. I, I haven't seen how they're made. But if I'm, right. if I'm looking for a general symbol that I can use for a, like, I mean, I have a marching program in addition to all the other things. So right. we, we need 9,000 symbols. So, so one of the things that, that we have to be careful with, with hand, hand, hand hammered symbols, as opposed to non hand hammered symbols is making sure that the students don't bear down real hard on those symbols. They don't have to work as hard for that sound to come out. So if we're using one of those, uh, use one of those hand hammered, like high end symbols, we're going to talk about in a second. Students can like get, if if they're like really bearing down, it, it can wash out the sound of the ensemble. So we have to be really, really careful with those. When I, when I introduced those into the mix, I had to really like, I, you know, this isn't like, your symbol at home. You don't have to work as hard kind of thing. So it's, it, it's a, it's a different timbre for the kids to get used to as well. So, but I'm, I'm, I really like uh, the, the mine L symbols by, by, by Zans. Uh, they're, they're really, uh, they're, they're also a for, very affordable. We were just talking about affordable symbol. Um, uh, the, uh, then of course, diligent pasty and, and, and Sabian and all those. Um, but, Check out Memphis Drum Shop has a YouTube channel where they're uh, the, uh, the the clinician that have different drum set players and clinicians playing kits with the cymbals on them, playing different grooves. You can get a really good idea. I mean, every cymbal is a little different, but you can get you know you can get that idea of uh, what that that particular model cymbal is going to sound like in relation to uh, the, the drum set itself. And and you get a get a pro playing it. It's it's it's, it's great. That's great. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, worth checking out. and for anybody who wants to follow along with this clinic that that we're following of Mike's, it is on his website. Mike come off under free resources, um, so people are always welcome to check out what we're reading off of as well. For yeah. auxiliary percussion and vibes, obviously we have the biggest thing is congas and vibraphone. If mm-hmm. you have more more players in your percussion section, right? So you want to be careful with doing too much doubling so that it doesn't and 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 adding too many toys so that it doesn't. Uh, it, it doesn't get overpowering and mask what's going on in the ensemble because that can easily uh, get away from 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 us if we're not paying attention as directors. So one of the things, just just I'm all for keeping everybody employed and and mm-hmm. and, and, and hands on and everything, but we have to just make sure that we're we're just not uh, we're not letting things get out of control back there dynamically and and uh, and, with, and, and the rhythm's getting too busy. We you know just keeping it simple and and uh, making sure they're playing the accents and the music. Yeah. All right. So yeah. let's try, let's listen to one of your charts. Um, okay. How about stomping at the Savoy? Can you tell us a little bit about, about that chart? Yeah. So this, this I had I got a, a, that year uh, that would have been in the, during the pandemic. I wrote this chart, um, and uh, it turned out really great. But when I got the assignment, I could not get Bill Holman's arrangement for the Stan Kenton band out of my head. So. Mm-hmm. I had to like listen to a whole bunch of different small group recordings and and and, and kind of come at it from a different way. So on this one, um, I do it as a uh, I do the A sections of the of the tune uh, over a halftime shuffle groove or a hip hop feel, and then the the bridge swings uh, every time. 
I try to be real careful with the tune. The, the root movement of the tune on the bridge is a little tricky because it's a lot of half, what we call half step shifts. You know, E flat dominant to E dominant back to E flat, mm -hmm. and then it goes around the circle a little bit. Um, so I, I try. I purposely wrote figures that would be accessible to young musicians. I didn't get crazy with it. I kept that in mind as, as I was uh, was uh, writing that. And I think we're going to hear the, the the beginning and uh, and a little bit of the ensemble stuff after the yep. solos. So, and this is this is green cover from Alfred. Yeah, it's coming in at about a two and a two and point five. I would I would characterize that. I don't think it's right at the, the two level. I think there's enough. Yep. There's some eighty stuff towards the end and the solely section after the solos. That's a, a it's a quote of a of a, of a uh, Sam Jones tune called "Bittersweet" that gets kind of gets worked around um, the trumpets and saxophones a little bit. It's a little melody, but um, but it's but it, it it lies pretty good in this key, and uh, I think it, it comes off pretty well. But I'd say two point five. All right, let's check it out. Here it is. That's a great chart. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, I, I, I'm really happy with the way that one turned out. And then, then of course, the, the musicians playing it are all great players here in the D.C. area. So sure. it's, it's, uh, it's, all, it's a lot of my friends are on it. So, <laughs> can I, uh, so it's very cool. It's nice to have such talented friends. Um, can, yeah. I, uh, can I give a couple of charts of yours or a handful of charts of yours that I've bought over the decades? and and can recommend sure. to people all right um yes. so we're not we're not going to listen to any of these and all of these are in the are, like i mentioned that green cover two two and a half series um i'm a believer in using a lot of tunes that are standard tunes um so i like a lot uh cantaloupe island that's that's probably one of your more famous ones um yeah. li little sunflower by freddie hubbard if people don't know that tune it's basically two chord changes i actually featured a, sun a singer on that one um, oh nice and then two cannonball tunes that I really like, Sack of Woe and Styx. If people, especially oh. if people don't know Styx, that tune is such a great tune. I don't know how much that's sold, but that's one of my favorite charts. Yeah, it, it's done pretty well. It's a, it's a, you know, anytime you can take a the, a blues form and do something different to it, it's mm -hmm. it's kind of cool. So that, the fact that it's a fourteen bar blues is, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with the way all those turned out and they, yes they all do well and thank you for mentioning those I appreciate and i it. i like that you use the nat adderley solo in that arrangement yeah the um there's there's one version that it's one of the live cannonball versions of that tune that is just like it's so smoking all right um no, let's, uh, mercy mercy i think is what yes you're talking about. that's that's the one. Oh yeah. man if yeah. i could play the trumpet like that whew. <laughs> um he's on fire on all right let's go on to setup 
Sure. So, um, you know, I, I think we have to use a, uh, and I had a problem with this when I taught uh, uh, at, at Baker for all those years, um, because of, my room was set up in tiers. So that's that's really, that's, that can make rehearsal problematic. But I, I I found a workaround. It took me several different tries and, and, and uh, lots of time of experimenting, years of experimenting, actually. But I think we have to, as directors, start fostering uh, a setup that is going to allow for uh, verbal and nonverbal communication from the students in the rhythm section. Mm -hmm. So they start working together as a team. So trying to have a setup where at least the guitar and the piano have, are in a, a, uh, have a sight line and then a setup where your piano, bass and drums have a sight line. Mm -hmm. I like to keep the guitar on, 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 on line with the saxophones and then kind of the piano on line with, with at the end there too. I think that's, a, you know, pretty standard. But I, I think that having uh, having everybody in the rhythm section have some sort of formal communication with one another is, is really, really important uh, and, and, that, and having that sight line. And then the amp placement is huge. Um, big, big time. We want to make sure that, so we want to make sure if we're using if we're using a bass amp that's that's not like like I mentioned the hard key kickback earlier, where the sound, you, know, you turn it on, it turn it on, look, look, it kicks, it kicks back, the sound shoots out. So um, if we're not using something like that, we have to get it up off the ground so that it, it, it projects a little bit. Um, so that's huge and important. And we want to make sure that the placement of it is behind the bass player, mm -hmm. Correct. not in front of the bass player. They can't hear what's coming out of the amp if it's in front. I don't know how many times I see that, with especially with young directors. It's like, yep. you know, we have a saying, don't do that, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, just don't do that. You know, so we, we want to make sure that we that we can hear, the student can hear what's coming out of the, the amp itself. Um, and, and, that then, they're, and that they're far enough in front of it, like I, I was told two to three feet, so you're not covering it. It's almost like there's an ice cream cone of sound coming out and you're in that sound, but not close. That's a great feet. way of looking at it. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. I'm going to use that. that I like that. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I'm stealing that. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, we want to make sure that that's, that, that, that's happening. And you don't want to be too close to the amp either, because then you're going to get feedback. So that's a great way of doing it too. And then... Um, with the guitar, we want um, Mike Christensen, who does clinics for Mel Bay and and and, and everybody. He was telling me this, um, and I never really thought about this because and when I do this um, clinic and I'm, I'm showing my PowerPoint, I have a diagram of this, mm -hmm. and he, he was saying I wouldn't do what's on that diagram, and I hadn't really thought about what was on the diagram. But the amp and in, in that in the example I use is on the wrong side it's on the pickup side so he's he's saying no you don't want that you want the amp on the next side of the guitar so i hadn't thought about that so so that has to sit back as well so that's something that you know i guess i had done maybe correctly and incorrectly over the years because i really wasn't paying attention to that but why but, is that but what was his reasoning just for feedback okay so I, I don't know. That's, that's something to think about an experiment. But he he is he was mentioning that to me, and when I was presenting this clinic, and he happened to come through, um, and I thought that was a great thing, to, uh, a great piece of knowledge to be aware of at least. That, so if we're getting feedback, we need to switch it to the other side. But again, the, the the amp has to be behind the player, sure, so that we can we uh, they can hear themselves and not be in a power contest to play louder. And obviously, the drums and the bass need to have visual contact. And I actually did uh, yes. this exercise on Monday with my with my band. I had my guitar player, my bass player, and my drummer all hold up their right hand and then like keep the beat together on their lap or something like that yeah, to get, well, yeah, to get yeah. the groove going. Because obviously not only are they all playing quarter notes or a variation of, but they're all playing with their right hands in the same thing. So especially the drums and the bass getting that that groove, the visual groove is big. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's here's something else too. And this is from one of my other clinics. And if this isn't in the, the this clinic per se, but just that time alignment between your your bass player's appendages and your drummer's appendages, everything has to be working together at the same time. And what ends up happening, I think, sometimes with young directors, is they overshoot with the literature, and or they don't have the skill set yet to, to get that information across in there because their their knowledge is developing. Yep, uh, we're always we're always all developing, but you know what I mean. But like it's they're not there yet, but they're overshooting. Sure. So like been there <laughs> one of the, yeah yeah well we've all been there right so one of the one of the things that, that, to think about is is that you know your lit choice making sure that it's really repetitive and this is something that like i said i mentioned in one of my other clinics 
if you're if you're let's say you're playing a blues tune with your kids and the the bass line is rewritten differently every chorus of the chart why right For if it's a if it's a young jazz chart really why there's no reason for that. I mean, because we're not building confidence. We're we're at this point, that doesn't build confidence at all. Because yeah. the bass player, especially if they're like a, a class, they've been playing in orchestra and they're still just just getting used to playing in half position, that's not good at all. So we want to make sure that you know, feel free to write it up. I, I that's one of my pet peeves. I think that that sometimes writers when they're writing for young jazz ensembles don't get that because they have maybe they haven't been in the classroom i don't know but but it's that's that happens so don't don't be afraid to take a blues line and just keep using it over and over again or a baseline that works you know what i mean like a baseline yeah, that, that for sure that doesn't get rewritten there's no there's no reason in that if you look at the baselines in my charts for all those young jazz ensembles it's it, i don't do many variations if i i have to do a rhythmic variation because i don't where i put a chord yeah but I do that on purpose so that that builds confidence. And I think that's something that we have to look at. All right. I went on a, I got <laughs> no. my soapbox on that. Sorry. No, it's great. It's great. Um, all right. So that's, that's set up. Let's go on to one of your other charts. Um, sure. C- compared to what? Tell us a little bit about this chart. So this is a tune that uh, Eddie Harris and, and Les McCann recorded uh, in Montreux, Switzerland in 1960. It was written by this uh, Eugene McDaniels, who is an activist, um, at, at the time uh, in the late 60s. And I I believe Roberta Flack recorded this before uh, uh, Les and, and, uh, and Eddie did. And it became um, part of their Swiss movement uh, album for Atlantic Records, which also yielded Cold Duck Time, which is kind of uh, sure. another another great tune uh, that has, uh, it's, it's that soul jazz type groove and, and, and feel to it. And this tune, um, it, is is uh it was, it was really fun to get this assignment but if you listen to the original recording they don't get to the tune for like three minutes there's this huge long introduction and i'm like what am i going to do with this so I, I took a snippet of it and used it in the introduction and then uh the introduction of the tune actually becomes developmental material later on in the chart um which i'm not sure we get do we get to that in the no, I don't remember. Uh, no, yeah, you actually you do. You we, we're going to hear that we're going to hear the the we're going to hear that development uh after the solo section going yep. into uh, g- going into the shot. We're not going to hear the shot, but you, we're going to get a snippet of that. So if if folks are familiar with that, you'll hear that you'll hear that chromatic walk up as I call it that 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 uh that Les McCann does. That's it's it's a 3 minute chromatic walk up on the <laughs> original recording, but Great. it's a uh, yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. This was a, this was a fun one to do, and there's even like a little. Uh, the bass line is also part of, uses um, the uh, the one lick in "I Can't Turn You Loose," which is, of course, you know, among other things, was a great song that Aretha Flank- Franklin recorded and many others. But it was also the Blues Brothers theme song, so I kind of there's some interplay on that in the uh, in the in the shot chorus too. So. so, so this is of the grade two and a half level as well. Uh, I'll also mention yeah. it's it's clear of your your public school teaching experience um, when you write these charts. You've already alluded to that originally, but I think grade arrangers have that knowledge of the level they're writing for and what they can and can't do. So, uh, thank you for that. Here's compared compared to what.
that's such a great chart. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, I'm really happy with the way that one turned out. And yeah, the, yeah, soul jazz was the, uh, the is the the, the the term I was talking about earlier. That's I think that tune's kind of the epitome of that kind of groove. And if directors check that out, uh, check the original out. Uh, just beware that there's uh, you may want to uh, listen to that before you play for your students. There's a little colorful language in the the first uh, the original of that. Maceo Parker has a great version that's a lot clean. That's Point. There's, there's no problem. It's very kid friendly. So, great. All right. Let's go. Let's next go on to your section about notation concerns with rhythm sections. Absolutely. So, I think one of the things that we have to, we have to get across the students and 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 how I did this and it took me. I alluded to that when I got to Baker about how kind of it was everything was a mess and I didn't understand what to do with a jazz band. The first thing that I did my second year doing jazz band. Not my first year, but the the second year doing jazz band at the middle school. It wasn't a class, so it was a, everybody stayed after school kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I had the rhythm sections come without the horn section, I think two or three times, because I could not deal with all these horn players. <laughs> you know what middle school children are like, right? Sure. So, sure. like, just just you know, like I just couldn't deal with. Uh, okay, I I I, I got to teach this student right here, you guys need to be quiet for a minute. So it's like the way around the workaround on that it, for me it was to pull those students in separately and address these concerns about notation. So, and I think, and and this also goes with knowing your role in the rhythm section too. Um, so it, not so much in young jazz ensemble music in the beginning jazz ensemble music, everything's pretty much written out, but we still have to, we, we still have lots of concerns to get to. So mm -hmm. there, there are different things that we have to talk about in the music, especially in the guitar parts, because the guitar parts are going to have, there's going to be slash notation, which means they're comping. There's going to be the rhythmic notation, which means they can play the chords but over the rhythm that's printed. Uh, and then, of course, they're going to have, uh, you know, any any kind of, they're, they're going to have melodic material as well. So, or figures that they have that are, are all written out. So we want to make sure that they understand their role and what all these different things mean. And they're going to have some concerns about chords and what to do. Thank goodness, a lot of the charts now come with the chord sheets mm -hmm. uh, and we do that. And, and, and my best advice is if you're not familiar with that, is to make sure that you have somebody that's a go-to that can, that can come in and help a little bit. Uh, I've been very fortunate over the years that I've had students that get into it, that study with others, and I've had other former students come back and help me out uh, over the years. So that's yep. creating a system like that for yourself is really good. Um, and then in the piano parts, just understanding that, you know, maybe you need to leave some things out. Maybe it's overwritten for the, your 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 ability level at this point. So making sure that that, that we address those concerns. But again, the, uh, as the music advances, we're going to see those same notational things that the guitars are going to be seeing from the get-go. Is that We're going to see slashes, we're going to see rhythmic figures, and we're going to see notes written, all written out. Um, and then some of this, even some of the young jazz ensemble stuff in our uh, 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 in, in our grade two category for for Alfred and with some of the other publishers, we're starting to cue chords in the piano parts now. Mm -hmm. So that's for the more advanced players playing it. That's that's that that you you know they understand what's going on and can do that. But younger students might need that explained to them. Just you know, if you want to sure. take the time to explain the theory about what's going on behind them, great. And if not, that's that's fine too. But they're there. That's there as an option. Um, and then, of course, bass again. Most at this level, most everything's written out. They may have some chord changes as well. So if you have an advanced player, you can explain. You can yeah, you can go here. And again, with those bass parts, again, don't 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 feel free to uh, to rewrite if, yep. if you need to or repeat or reuse material that happens earlier in the chart just to gain that confidence. Uh, for the, so the students gain that confidence. And then the drum parts, you know, it. it if, we, if you've got a, a student who's, you know, uh, they kind of understand how to play kit a little bit and they've been playing, you know, in the in the band class in the percussion section, they're used to looking at one part at the same time, not multiple things happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. So just getting kids to understand, you know, have hands, feet, uh, you know, stems up or hands, stems down or feet. There's a great... Um, it used to be on the PASIC site, but if you if it, it's it comes up in a Google search, uh, it's called Basic Beats by Steve Houghton. It's it's like it's a pan, it's basically like a four page like handout that mm -hmm. PASIC made years ago um, that describes the nomenclature to the students and 
and uh, to, in, in very basic terms that middle school students can understand and young musicians can understand. And then um, uh, it also it also uh, notates out uh, basic swing grooves, different swing grooves, different rock grooves, and different bossa grooves, which is where which is right in the wheelhouse of a beginning jazz ensemble, right? So um, that, that's that's a great uh, handout. Again, it's Basic Beats by Steve Houghton. You can just search it on the internet; it comes up. So I, it's not on Basic site anymore, but I think it's yep. it's floating around out there in the interwebs. Yeah. Yeah, so it's nice to hear you as a as a established arranger and writer say those things because I've been doing those things for years. Um, you know, like w- whatever your bass player needs to do to be able to play, you know, w- whether they're starting with roots only or you write your own bass line for them to play Absolutely. and they play that instead. Or if the piano player, if you write a part for them before you ever hand it out and you hand them your part, it, it, whatever they need to do to be able to play, you know, I've had drummers who need to read everything on the paper and drummers who can learn it all by ear, right? Because some fills, right. some drum parts, if you play what's there, it's killing. And others, it's like, oh, I'm going to ignore half of this, but I'm going to play what, what the pro drummer played, right? It's right. really about what, what's going to swing and what's going to be at your kid's level for confidence. Right. Well, you have to meet the kids where they're at. It's, and, and that's exactly it. And that's, that's a great, that's, you, you put that very well, Kyle. I, I, I agree totally. We have to make sure that, 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 that we're being true to the music, but we have to be true to the students and make sure that they're 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 making the music come off and they're feeling good about themselves. All right, let's listen to another chart. Yeah. Okay, cool. Which one's up next? Hot House. This is a, ta- oh. a Tad Dameron tune, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Uh, and this was uh, um, it's, it's like features trumpet and alto. This is more for uh, this is our in our grade. This is the blue cover jazz band series. So it's, yep. this is. This is more like a three and a half. Um, the, the the angularity of the uh, of the melody of this tune really makes it a three and a half. Um, just just to get uh, I, and I put it just in the uh, alto one and trumpet two parts. Um, uh, the the yep. real angular stuff. So it's, I and, didn't give it to every I didn't give it to everybody. <laughs> I kind of on purpose. Yes, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. That was. And again, like. I really like having charts where you can listen to historical recordings in addition to the arrangement. So this is one yeah. of those. Let's let's check it yeah. out. Hot, Hot House. Okay. Such a great chart. That's Soli's kicking. Thank you. Yeah, I I, I always love writing sax Soli's and uh, and, uh, and just making those lines come off and making it build. And I got away with some crunchy voicings there on the bridge too. <laughs> so that was good. 
hey, so while we're at it, let's listen to another tune too. Do you want to do one of sure. the one of the other jazz ones we haven't done, or do you want to do a concert band? Sure, yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah, yeah. All right, so tell us about Sweet Emma. Well, Sweet Emma is a tune by Nat Adderley. Uh, this is a new one that's coming out this year. Uh, it's in the green cover. It's a two, two and a half. It's, it, it's. I think well, we put a key change in towards the end, which I don't think we're going to hear. Um, uh, or when we may hear the beginning of it. Um, uh, and the the tune is uh, Nat's tribute to Sweet Emma Barrett, who was. Um, the leader of the first preservation all jazz band, really. She was, she was, uh, ain't going to give you none of my jelly roll was one of her tunes. So she, uh, great piano player, just really, really soulful. Um, and, uh, Nat wrote this, this 16 bar, another, it's kind of like a soul, another soul jazz type tune, uh, uh, in, um, and, and, uh, kind of as a dedication to her and an appreciation to her. And it's a lot of fun. I put a, um, I put a corral on the beginning, kind of like the chicken, or, you know, that kind of like that kind of thing, uh, and it works out pretty good. Uh, it's got solo space for trumpet and alto, uh, and there's a breakdown section, which I think we're going to hear, and then it goes into a shout, which it modulates. Um, Pete Barenbray does a great job of finding these these nugget tunes that are like just so good, um, and this was a lot of fun. Pete's our editor at, at sure. Alpha; he's the jazz, sure. jazz projects editor, and he's he's the master at giving finding these tunes and then like working with the writers to make sure it works. Obviously with this catalog, it's just, it's an amazing collection of, of charts. So he's, he's the master. So when he says, I, I want you to check this out, then I, of course I check it out. And it was like, this is a great tune. I had no, I had not heard this tune until he asked me to write an arrangement on this. And All right. It, it's great. Yeah. All right. Here's sweet Emma.
It's a great chart. And I'm sure that will sell really well. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I'm yeah. really happy with the way that turned out. Yeah. Yeah. Great tune too. I never, like I said, never heard it before. So, so All right. I was asked. So, so um, the next section of your, of your um, presentation to, is called working as a team, getting your rhythm section to groove, right? So what's that yeah. all about? So um, one of the, one of the Alfred products that, that kind of, I, I really like it. And, and I, I think it's, if, if I were a high school teacher, I would definitely be using it. It's a little bit, a little bit, uh, uh, now I want to say advanced, but it's not enough of the bare bone basics for 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 middle school students. But it's it's the big picture concepts, and the the textbook is called uh, the rhythm section uh, the rhythm section workshop, and uh, it was a collaboration between Shelley Berg, uh, Fred Hamilton, Lou Fisher, and Steve Houghton, and they collaborated on on writing uh, uh, material for developing rhythm sections, basically. And one of the key points that they talk about in, in the textbook is uh, that they, they kind of define like some of these terms that we use every day, but in a jazz setting. So like, so like the groove is the constant subdivision of uh, a groove is a constant energy channel into subdivision. Um, and subdivision is breaking down the pulse, of course, into smaller portions, which we all know. Um, and then they kind of talk about clarity and deference and they kind of clarity kind of, it, and deference kind of uh, act hand in hand. So like mm -hmm. if, if we play with, if we play too loud, if we over, you know, if we play with the wrong technique, if we play, uh, you know, just not in the correct style, that's, that's, that's not clear. That's not that we're not providing clarity for the band that, that, you know, and that's really the, that's part of the goal of, and the teamwork that has to happen yep. in the rhythm section is we need that clarity. And so, and, yeah. and, and I'm going to jump in real quick. And one of the yeah. struggles, struggle, some of the struggles as a high school teacher, because you have kids who are starting to come into their own and start really being able to play is getting them to play less and knowing when to play so that they don't, you know, cause if everybody plays probably half of what they can, then you'll have a better, better, more clear group. I don't know. I don't know how many times I say the phrase less is more. <laughs> it's like when I'm working with kids, it's like this. No, don't, don't give me everything that, you know, just play, play the time, play the groove, play, have fun with it, but don't, you don't need to be doing all that. So yeah, it's, and, and that's hard as directors. Cause we want, we don't want to stifle that, 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 that excitement that's going on. But at the same time, everybody has to understand their roles too. So it's a slippery slope. We have to, it, it, that's, you bring up a good point, Kyle. It's really hard to, to do that at times, but we, but that's not part of our job too, is to make it all come off. Right. So anyway, so then, then clarity, uh, kind of leads us into their topic of, of deference. And that comes from kind of yielding to one another in the rhythm section, especially guitar and piano. Like if we're like, if we're comping at the same time, are we comping in the same register or maybe not comp at the same time at all? I just did an honors band this last weekend where where we worked it out in specific spots where the you know they I let them have some autonomy in that but it's like mm -hmm. like okay we not you're all playing too similarly <laughs> here so this it's too much information for the band here at this point so let's let's make sure that we're you know we're we're deferring to one another here and you have to figure that out so and they, and of course they like that too because then they're not playing every single measure of every single tune as as well so um, and it gives them it gives them a break too. So just kind of deferring to one another, knowing when to uh, when knowing when it's okay, like in a comping situation where it sounds okay, mm -hmm. uh, both piano and guitar can comp at the same time, and knowing when to get out of it. So if it's kind of, kind of cluttered and it's not clear as to what's going on, then it it's probably time to employ uh, you know, employ some deferral. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I'm yeah. going to jump to the last one on here, the listening, because there's active listening where we have all of our kids sit and listen and you analyze and you talk about what you're hearing and you try to emulate and copy and play with the recording mm -hmm. and, and record yourself and yeah. all that. But there's also, I want to promote the passive listening. You know, to me, it, I, I liken it to secondhand smoke. You know, like if anytime your kids are in your band room, anything you can have playing, it gets in there somehow, even if they're not actively listening to it. Yeah. Oh, it's a we, uh, Paul Lucchese is one of my dear friends. He now is teaching at uh, Fresno City College, but he was at Buchanan High School in Fresno, California. And he would begin each of his jazz ensemble rehearsals with listening. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so good. And, and I adapted that. So when I saw him do that, I said, well, I, I, I did it quite frequently, but I didn't start. And, yep. and I didn't start with it. I incorporated it into every rehearsal. And I thought it was so important. And now with 
YouTube in the classroom. If you can do that, you know, we would watch some, you know, historically significant performances too that exist. So that was great too. And just making making those connections, it's really important. And then and, getting the kids to just listen as an ensemble yeah. too is an up part of that. As well. And one of the things that's been happening a lot more recently that I think is the word is spreading is getting your kids to move and dance to that music as they're listening to it. You know, sometimes yeah. even even singing rhythms, um, playing rhythms with, you know, like I'll do certain things to brush his backing track, but why don't I put on, you know, um, a tune by Clark Terry and have us do it to that rather than a backing right, track. So right, there's right, so right. many different ways to participate in that in that listening process. Yeah. And I'm going to date myself here like tremendously, but but, you know, the days of turning on, you know, TV or your media, dialing up your media, however you're watching it and seeing Jazz on television is, unfortunately, it's not in the mainstream. And, and I grew up in an era where, you know, like my mom had the television on while she was cooking and, you know, the Merv Griffin show was on and there's Jack Sheldon and Ray Brown and there's the Tonight Show band. And you're like, so we have to help the students make those connections. So the more that we can play, yep. like, 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 like you're talking about Kyle, that, yeah, the more that we can put it out there for the kids, help them make the connections. And and, and, off and, and any of those and, and, and any of those shows that still use those bands are on too late and the kids are in bed. So, um, right, right, yeah, great. Yep. All right, let's listen to your last jazz yeah. chart that's that we're choosing for today in the still of the night, which is a okay. great, great standard tune. Why don't we listen to it first and then tell us a little bit about the process afterwards? to tell you i hate cutting up any of those charts because like i like i've told you i i it, the whole thing's great but you know in the in the essence of time well, no, demo, in the interest of yeah. time yeah yeah um so yeah. that's a, isn't that a cole porter tune it is a cole porter tune that's another new one that's coming out this year and um the 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 trick that trick the, the problem that happens with arranging that tune is that 
the form of the song is so long, it's 72 measures. So it's like, okay, how am I going to break this up? So, and, and make this playable so that, that you, you, we heard the first chorus and then a little bit of the shout. And so the solo section ends up being four 16 measure sections, plus a little eight bar interlude in there, uh, to, uh, a little bit of the form. So it's like two soloists, eight measure interlude, two more soloists, and then, uh, into the shout, um, yeah. which we truncated the form for, for the shout too, because we weren't going to put three 72 measure courses. <laughs> Right. Chart. So it was. It was a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a struggle there, and on, the, on the, uh, with the uh, the development after the solo section. I mean, what are we going to do? And so it just whittled it down to a, a, a full ensemble thing and a uh, and a recap of the tune, uh, the latter half of the tune or latter uh, section of the tune. Yeah. So it worked. I, I think it turned out great. And then, of course, the band is killing on it. Yeah. On the recording. Can I point out one more yeah. thing the band directors can do when they're working on charts? Um, Absolutely, I, please. Um, take out backgrounds when you can. Um, Terry White tells me that a lot. That you know, he's asked as an Alfred writer and a writer from other places, they're asked to write because it gives security to the chart and it gives security to the soloist. But if you have soloists who are playing, and uh, you can open up for longer choruses than what's written, as well as um, taking out backgrounds to give this soloist more space. Right. So absolutely. I mean, I, I, I do that with groups. You take it out, if, especially if you've got a burning soloist and you've got somebody that's that's really into it. Uh, and then if especially if you're opening up solo sections too, you know, let's say you're doing a blues even with, with your students and there's like printed backgrounds. Well, don't keep playing those backgrounds every chorus because mm -hmm. you know, that's giving the same information to the audience. I mean, the kids might need that at first as you're going along to like, okay, I know where I'm at in the form kind of thing and then take it away from them because that's that's too much of the same information for the audience sure. over and over again. Yeah. Great. All right. Let's get on to the last section, yeah. the, the last section of the clinic, which is uh, entitled yeah. Approaching Different Styles and Grooves. And you break this into the swing groove, the bossa nova groove and the rock groove. Right. So basically what what this is and, and when I do this in the clinic is I, I actually scroll scores uh, and uh, or I work with a live rhythm section and I, and I take the take the, the, the audience and the group through. What are what are some of the pitfalls of the different styles? Swing is, of course, the cornerstone of of, of this style, and we want to make sure that everybody kind of has a has a grasp on that. Just getting that the, the just getting the right ride symbol pattern to dance and not be you know like too stiff. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes when you listen to old school drummers, that you know they, right. it was notated as dotted eight sixteenth, and some of them kind of did that. I mean, you know, you listen to how tight Mel Lewis's ride symbol pattern is it's 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 very tight so sure. it's it, it's kind of a preference thing so you want to make sure that we have that kind of thing happening we have that time alignment happening in the rhythm section if we're doing something that's kind of rooted in the count basie style is are you having the guitarist you know like are are they doing are they doing the right technique are they are they going down strokes with the, the accents on two and four or are they comping in a different manner uh, and that's a that's a good way when we're talking about clarity and deference on a on a swing chart, making sure that if it's a, a tune in that kind of style that the guitarist is actually playing in the right style. That mm -hmm. helps with, with clarity uh, as well. Um, so and then and making sure that the the, the the all everybody's swinging the eighth notes and everybody kind of has an understanding of of that and and that's 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 pretty big. As far as the the like the, the bossa nova goes, are we use again? Are we do, do we understand the clave rhythm? Which clave rhythm is it? Do we understand mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And are we putting the accents in the right spot? Is your drummer actually playing a two measure pattern for that clave pattern? Or are they playing a cheater groove? And that's okay if they're playing a cheater groove, but like you know, like you know, try to get that that two bar pattern, whether it's a three two or two three or whatever variation of it it is making sure that that's happening and that the bass part and that sometimes what I hear and that is, is that the, the bass drum and the bass notes don't always line up with young musicians and, mm -hmm. and, and they kind of should highlight each, you know, like the, the part should kind of work in tandem with one another. So if, if you got a boss and any kind of Latin, Latin a groove going and it's not, if things aren't lining up and it's not sounding good, that's probably where the problem is. That's is awesome. you're, it, might be, it might be happening in the bass drum might be happening in the bass if they're not on the page, but it's most likely your bass drummer's foot or your drummer's um, foot. One, one question. I mean, typically we use 3-2 or 2-3 clave um, throughout the rhythm section. Are there ways to use like a 2-3 and a 3-2 at the same time within a rhythm section? 
I'm not the guy to ask on that. One. Okay, all right. I, I, I guess no. I guess you could. You could. You could if it's if, if the accents are. are, are if, I think if the players are strong enough and the, and and the groove is, I, I I'm not sure that that would give. I don't know. I, okay. I'm, I'm probably not the person to ask on that. Yeah, that's what Michelle I Fernandez for, would that's, be the person. I'll ask Michelle. That's you that's went what off the cuff. You asked Michelle. That's what I you get asked for Michelle. Asking. <laughs> all right. I'm going to defer. Speaking of deference, I'm going to defer to her on that one. Yeah. Wonderful. And let's talk about rock. Yeah. Um, just making sure the students don't overplay because as soon as they get like a, a, a tune like that, I think what, what ends up happening is, is, is they're going to overplay, especially uh, again, drums can start adding stuff and just, and, and just making sure that they, that if they're taking liberties with what's printed on the page, making sure that it's not getting in the way of, of the arrangement itself. And it's, and it's, it's, you know, if they're giving a variation of the groove that's on the page, making sure that it's not conflicting with what's going on on the ensemble and sending all kinds of misinformation out to the ensemble. Cause that can, that easily happens on rock tunes with, with students and it just gets, the, the volume goes up and then they yep. start overplaying and it's like, especially yeah, if you have a drummer good. who's like, I've been waiting three years to play this groove. And then they just rock <laughs> instead of like actually being musical yeah. and playing rock. <laughs> you're right. It's like, and they just blow the chart off and you're like, no, 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 this is not how this works. But yeah, yeah. this is not how any of this works. <laughs> you know, we want to make sure that they're, they're, they're kind of being true to the arrangement. And that's another thing I explained to students, no matter what the style it is. And we've talked about this in, in, in any ensemble is, it, are we making, are we, or would, if the arranger walked in the room or the composer walked in the room, would they be happy with what's going on? Sure. It's kind of like my, my, my thing with, with any group that I'm, I'm with. And then and I think that's, overplaying like in a style like that it's like the arranger would not dig that classic so like, don't do that okay. yeah um yeah. all right i'm going to read through you have some resources here i'm going to read for everybody to to uh get these titles and write them down again they can find them on your sure. website as well mightcomeup.com mm -hmm. on the free resources area and then i want to talk a little bit about yeah. your the concert band side of things uh as well yeah so some resources rhythm section workshop for jazz directors that's the one you mentioned earlier for piano mm -hmm. the jazz jazz piano handbook by michelle weir um, playing Jazz Piano by Bob Mincer and the Jazz Keyboard Toolbox and the Jazz Pianist. Those are all yep. tunes for guitar. Yep. Um, yep. For guitar, Jazz Guitar Harmony. For bass, the Total Bassist. And for drums, Big Band Drumming at First Sight and Big Band Drumming Philosophy. Get it? Philosophy yep. by Steve mm -hmm. Finnick. Yeah, those the those uh, Steve's drum uh, drum books are uh, incredible resources for. Uh, developing drummers in, in the in the jazz band, especially especially uh, uh, for students that, that well well, 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 well let me let me come, kind of paddle back. But first, the the big band drumming at first sight literally is taking them through. It's kind of what I was explaining about with with that that uh, Steve Houghton handout. Um, it that this breaks it down with charts and, and recordings, and it, it's it's it, it's 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 a great resource, a val invaluable resource. And then the phil the ph philosophy one, that's great too because it breaks down how to play fills in relation to the ensemble figures that are sure. happening uh, uh, in, in the band. So it's, it's and it's written in terms that students can understand. So. Mike, I've known your name for a long time, and uh, it's always been on the jazz side of things. But I did mm -hmm. see in in as we said in your bio earlier that you have a master's in music ed. Sorry, a master's in instrumental conducting mm -hmm. um, as well. So how how long have you been writing for concert bands? Uh, I guess on the published the published side of things. Uh, um, we started about uh, twenty fourteen, I guess. Okay. Uh, so I don't think stuff came out till about 2014. So, or 2015 rather. So, cause everything's a year off. So I got the chance, uh, uh, Alfred offered me exclusive status back, uh, in, in 2012. And then I reached out to Bob Phillips, who was doing strings at the time and, and mentioned this to him that I was a middle school band or orchestra director. So then I ended up doing some things for him. And then I had written a piece, uh, for, uh, a, 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 a Pennsylvania MEA district band, uh, middle school band, and uh, I had sent that to um, George McGaw, who was at the time was the uh, uh, Bellwin band editor for Alfred. And uh, anyways, that led to, oh, you're exclusive. I didn't know that you were. Even, so then they started giving me assignments and everything like yeah. that. Uh, so I actually do more concert band writing for Alfred than I do uh, anything else. So, And I think I reached out to you because you, you've written, what's the, what's the easiest grade level you've written for? 
Point five. Point five. Yeah, that's what I thought. So my, and I my, just my, did one of those, and it's really, really not easy to do. And make no, it. no, oh, my, 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 my daughter played in a sixth grade honor band, and was mm-hmm. it, is it Great Beginnings? Is that the name of the piece? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah and is yeah. that a one, grade one? That's a, that's in that, that they they haven't it marked it as a point as a point five. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's because because of how the rhythms are written in it, and uh, and the intervallic relationships that we use. Sure. Yeah. So the two pieces of yours we're going to listen to are not of that grade level. Um, no. Let's listen to continuance first. What's what's that about? So it's a it's a grade three point five uh, band piece. It's uh, I didn't have a title for it when I got with it. My wife came up with the title because I continually morph these themes throughout it. So she said, "Why don't you just call it continuance?" And, okay, that's a great idea. So uh, Debbie uh, 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 penned the title on that one for me. Uh, but it's a uh, it. It, it, it's it's a, it's basically two different themes that get that get worked over uh, over and over and over again um, and in various formats and uh, it's part of our, our our performance plus series with Alfred and and Baldwin and it's uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this series it's it's uh, we're going to do the second uh, um, release in the series this year and what it is is it's a uh, it's it's digital only for the time being that's mm-hmm. going to come in print uh, over time but. Um, it's it's a digital only release. It's in Make Music Cloud with videos from uh, from uh, every two, uh, every piece in the series has videos and exercises written specifically for the piece um, from from the composer. Um, and it's it's a pretty neat interactive uh, series. Now you can also just download the uh, the performance pieces right directly from Alfred and Pepper and wherever sure. digital sources that you get music from. But um, uh, I'm very happy with the way this piece turned out and. Uh, yeah, go, go, let's take a listen.
cool. Great, great piece. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, that was, that turned out great. And uh, the ending sounds like I listened to too much television in the 70s and 80s, but that's okay. <laughs> but, All right. Uh, All right. Yeah. And the, the last piece we're going to listen to, tell us about that. Uh, we're, derivations. There's two versions of this. There's the, the version that we're going to listen to. There's also a flex version of this. And this is a, this is written for... Um, uh, our, I, I wrote it to be inclusive uh, uh, for our uh, cluster concerts here in Damascus, where we put the middle school and high school students together. Um, oh, it comes, comes in at the grade 2.5 level, uh, and it's a, a lot of fun to play. A lot of independence in the parts. It's not not a, the, there's block writing, but there's a lot of independent writing. I, I my grade even my grade two stuff. I, I'm 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 not the everybody moving all together at the same time kind of writing. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's just not me. Yep. So it's it's uh, it, it's quite challenging to play. It morphs from 4-4 four, four to 3-4. Uh, the B section is in 3-4. I think we're going to hear up to the uh, – the, we're going to hear into the, the second time the B themes come, comes back with some development, I think is what we're going to hear. So, All right, let's take a listen. So again, it's been great to listen to all your music today. And I just wanted to highlight, Thanks, we were just, we were just talking as well. Um, the importance of programming, you know, you said that and it made my heart happy because I've, I mean, I've done a bunch of episodes on programming, whether it's just playing a bunch of recordings for people, or we, I've talked with people like Hansby Rose about programming and things like that. It's just so important choosing the right level. And I just wanted to mention, you mentioned, um, one of your pieces was written for a flex series as well for people, people, this last one yeah, yeah. For, for people who don't know what that is that's where you can basically assign any part to any instrument within reason to fit this the strengths of your band and it's really a wonderful thing so if people haven't used a flex series they should consider it and if they're some, in situations there's some jazz flex charts too as yep. well some of the publishers have done some jazz flex tunes and it's it, it works out it's pretty cool yeah so the programming yeah. i was always taught by one of my mentors that programming was 90 percent of the battle it is. You have to know, you know, it's, it, it's, you have to know where your kids are at, where you want, you have to meet them where they're at. And, and then know what, have a sense of, am I going to have this window? Are they going to be able to master this in this window? And then my, my wife always talks about this too, is, is, you know, beginning with the end in mind, mm -hmm. know, you know, like if you know that you want to be playing, you know, this piece by the end of the year, well, you have to build that skill 
the skill sets throughout the year and reinforce that so that right. by the time we get to the end of the year, that, that, that it's going to be in your student's wheelhouse and they're going to be successful and it's going to sound good and they're going to be happy with it and proud of themselves for doing it rather than, oh, we kind of sort of did it or, we, you know, we, we missed the mark. And, and, you, and that's you, on us to do that. So, And you, you used a really important word, the word master, because I think so many times if we program too high, the kids can just get through it. But if you give them time to get to the finer points in the music making process, um, that young bands can sound really good as long as you're programming appropriately. Oh, absolutely. And, and finding that finding that lip that works, you know, we all have had go to, you know, like favorite writers, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, cut it all the time. You have to make sure that you, you know, it's, it's students are going to buy in. That's the whole thing, too. You want to make sure that they're going to buy into the piece. Uh, I know when I've gone out and done, done some of these honors bands this year, I, I retired this last year and I'm, I'm still doing those. I'm still doing a little bit of conducting and just making sure that the students are going to buy in on what you pick. And when you have a limited number of hours <laughs> with an honors group, that's like, oh, Lord, you know, is this really going to work or not? But, you know, I think teachers are also sometimes, especially young teachers, are a little reluctant. Like when they get in it, sometimes you don't you know, you're into a piece and it's not working, mm -hmm. get out of it. You know, I think it's, a, I think as, as we get older and we get more experience, we hear that it's not going to happen. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, it's, that for whatever reason, we thought it was going to work and it's okay that it didn't work, but don't, it's not a square peg and a round hole going for it. I, I, I will usually pull a piece after one read through. Um, you, you know, I've gotten to a point where if, you know, if they don't read it at 60, 70%, you know, and then I'll pull it and sometimes kids will say, oh, they're, they're frustrated with that or whatever. I'd say, look, you know, it, yeah. I just don't think it's a good fit for us right now. It's not that they can't play it or, or whatever, but yeah. 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 Everybody's gauge is different on that, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. You want to make sure that, that if it's not working, it's not going to work. Don't, you know, don't waste time on it. There's so much good lit out there that, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, we all expose ourselves, uh, our students to, it came out wrong, <laughs> expose our students to great lit and, uh, sure. you know, want to make sure that we are, um, you know, we're always putting good music in front of them and asking the most of them, but don't, we have to find that, that fine line of making sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're being true to our students and we're being true to the writer as well and making, making music off. Words of wisdom. I love Thanks. it. All That's right. Great. Thanks for, thanks so much for being with us, Mike. This was fun, Kyle. I appreciate the, the inv invitation. It's an honor to be here. And, uh, I, 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 I'm, Happy, happy that this all worked out. So, We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.